So we read, here's what you missed because I forgot. Matthew 24, 21, and 22. Go pause, read. Okay, and you're back. So going to look at those two verses, I mean, this is Jesus. Everything we've been reading in Revelation, this is Jesus saying exactly that. A time of tribulation is coming, and do you notice what he said? This is like something the world has never seen before. Well, good grief, the world's seen Noah. Think about that. There's been the great flood. You think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about all the things that's happened in our Old Testament, and now Jesus is saying, know what's coming. There's nothing in earth history to prepare you for what's coming in the book of Revelation. And that should stand out for you, especially because some people want to try and reason away the book of Revelation. I'm a literal guy, so I read the book literally. It works for all the, six, the 65 other books in the Bible. Why would I stop reading it literally on book 66? Does it make sense? So some people try to reason away. Guys, there's nothing in the history of the world that we can use to prepare us for what's going to be unleashed here. And that's what Jesus says. And unless those days were shortened, and if you remember, one of the words at the very beginning of Revelation was in tachii. You may not remember that word, but I'll have to flip because I've lost my first 17 pages of notes. But the good thing is, I've got a Bible. Revelation chapter 1. Da, 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 yeah, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The Revelation... Yeah, quick review. Revelation, you remember what that means? Apocalypsis, which means to do what? Reveal. To reveal. So in Revelation chapter 1, we're going to reveal. So here is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And that word in tachii, we'll see it again tonight, that means rapidly. So in other words, when... The stuff we've read about in here starts, it's going to do what? <laughs> Compared to the sum of human existence, this is going to go through quick. Matter of fact, if we went back to Daniel, Daniel already told us. How long is, pop quiz, how long is all this going to take? Seven. Seven years, but the bad part's going to unwind in how much? Three and a half years. And we're going to see all that again tonight. So, into Revelation, I think uh, we went through Revelation chapter 11 last week. I'm going to grab real quick, though. In Revelation chapter 11, we did it last week. But in Revelation chapter 11, we saw in the end times, there will be two witnesses come forth. And, and again, to me, the big thing that's so awesome about what we see in Revelation chapter 11 is here we see God, even in the midst of the worst time, God's still looking to save people. And, and we'll see the last altar call tonight. We'll get through that part of the book. So we see God sends out these, and guys, these guys got it great. Can you imagine this? These two guys, when they show up to a city, it stops raining, they control the weather, they can, they got everything. And if anybody comes against them, they just breathe fire. Try and stop my revival. You can't stop these guys. But then, but then, I love it. They, they work up. How do they end up dying? <laughs> it's, it's the beast. Antichrist himself ascends out of the bottomless pit to make war against them, overcomes them, and kills them. That is in verse 7. But if you remember, there was something very important in verse 7. The beast doesn't kill them until they've done what? When they finish their testimony. So I like how Satan thinks, yeah, I'm winning. It's like uh, their job was done. And then the beautiful thing was they laid in the street. If you remember, the beast kills the two witnesses. And they lay out in the street for, is it three days or four days? Three and a half days. And for three and a half days, their bodies are in the street. It says the entire world is watching them, which was never possible till the days of now where we could, the entire world could be sitting here watching these dead witnesses. Ah, oh, those preachers are finally dead. Good riddance. I'm glad they died. It even says they threw a party. 
They made merry with it. Can you imagine it? It's Happy Dead Witnesses Day. They're all celebrating. Yay, the preachers are dead. The preachers are dead. And then the next thing you know, after three and a half days, God just, whoop, and they're right back up again. Can you imagine that raining down on their parade at that point? They're so happy because the beast, the Antichrist, has killed these guys. And after three and a half days, a breath of life from God enters them. They stood on their feet. Can you imagine what they thought then? All right. So then it was in verse 15, the seventh angel sounded. So this was the seven trumpets. And then at this point, I love this announcement. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then they worship and worship, and it just keeps worshiping into Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, so now we're really kicking it off tonight. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. And I told you last week, I said the woman in this is Israel. Now the Catholic Church will say it's Mary and everything in here. Well, Jason, why would you say it's Israel? Because the Bible says it's Israel. This, this is not the first time in Scripture a woman, this, the sun, the moon, and... The 12 stars, it's not the first time it appears. It was in Genesis 17. It was Joseph's dream. If you remember, Joseph had a dream. He comes to tell his dad and his brothers all about his dream that the sun and the moon and the 11 stars are all going to bow down to him. And his dad goes, you think I'm going to bow down to you? So his dad and the mom being the sun and the moon and then the 11 stars were his 11 brothers. And his dad, you think I'm going to bow down to you one day? So what we were talking about, the woman clothed with her in sun and moon, this is, this is Israel. This is the children of Israel coming out of this. So now there's this woman, and then being with child, and so now it's like, wow, what child came out of Israel? Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be what? Upon his shoulders. So out of Israel comes a child, there's Christ. She cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, and there's Satan, having seven heads and ten horns. So when we go through scripture, it's always like, I think, like I remember reading this as a younger Christian, like I literally thought of a dragon like out of a movie with like seven horns, like seven heads. That's not what any of this means. If you go through and read scripture, whenever you see heads and crowns, we learned it all back in Daniel. Seven heads means there's going to be seven rulers involved in this. In other words, you're talking about these are kings or kingdoms that are involved. So this fiery red dragon, and again, we've already talked about this. Why use of words like dragon? Because this was written 2,000 years ago. And when you hear the word dragon for over the last 2,000 years, you don't exactly think about happy, good times, do you? Typically, we think <laughs> typically we think about dragons, though. Dragons aren't good things. Dragons are bad things. And so that's what the language is here. Seven heads, so seven kings or kingdoms. Ten horns. Horns always represent power. Seven diadems on his head. So there's seven crowns upon his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. If you know anything about Satan, when Satan fell, what did he do? He took with him a third of the other, well, a third of the angels fell with him and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days, which is exactly three and a half years. So we see a promise where God's going to shelter Israel. Uh, verse number seven, and a war broke out in heaven. You know, I do want to draw something out. I made a bunch of notes down here today on this. Have you ever thought about how hard Satan worked to try and kill off the Jewish race. If you think about it, it's really like you can tell it's unnatural and demonic how this worked. Go all the way back to Cain killing Abel. 
Cain kills Abel, and you got to think, Satan's thinking, I'm going to stop any of this stuff from ever happening. Yeah, but there's Seth. And out of Seth, the line continues. Uh, what about Noah? Can you imagine Satan? He thinks he's corrupted the entire earth. He's corrupted the entire earth, and now that's it. Ha, find your Messiah now. So what does God do? God preserves Noah and his family to come out of the flood, even in the worst time. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob steals his birthright from his brother, and what does his brother try and do? Tries to kill him for it. Keep on going. How about this? What about when Pharaoh tried to kill all the male children of Israel? Pharaoh, think about that. What kind of an un? Why would Pharaoh want to do that? Because Satan wants to prevent the Messiah from ever being born. So this war we're reading about, it's not new. What about Saul trying to kill David? Because in the end, the Messiah comes from who? David. David. So you try and kill David. But that's not in God's will. What about the book of Esther? You ever thought of that? You try and kill off every single Jew. But God doesn't have it because there's a Messiah to come out of the Jews. Uh, there's a lesser story. Uh, Ath Athaliah. It's in Chronicles. Athaliah kills all the heirs of Judah. He kills every heir in the line of Judah, except for Joash is hidden away. And through Joash's line, the Messiah is born. So at every attempt, what about when Jesus was even born? Do you remember what Herod tried to do when Jesus was born? Kill all the baby boys younger than two years of age. So this war that you're reading about is not new. Verse 7, a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the, his angels fought, and they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It's kind of an interesting verse, and so all I can think about in that is, do you remember in Job? How Satan kept kind of browsing up in the God's point of view. Have you considered my servant Job? I know Brother Mark David's been reading that book a lot lately. But we see at this point, whatever access Satan ever had to God, it's gone. God's finished with Satan at this point. You're not, you're not got any place to do with me anymore. And now we see this. Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. In verse 12 it says, For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Can you imagine what it's like on earth? Satan has been cast to earth the dragon is on earth, and every demon is now on the earth. It's not a good time to be on earth at this point. Uh, verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. I wasn't even going, I didn't highlight this verse. The only reason I put this in, there's this reference to the woman, Israel, was protected by the wings of two wings of a great eagle. And this is where some people have come and been like, aha, what's the symbol of the United States? It's an eagle. What's the symbol of the Air Force? Like the Sixth Naval Fleet or something is also an eagle is their thing. That's, guys, you use the Bible to interpret the Bible, not, we don't try and take our stuff and infuse into the Bible. So the reference to wings of an eagle is from Exodus 19.4. And so if you wanted to get a reference there, you can jot that note down. But it's not the first time that terminology has been used for, and essentially I wrote down a symbol of God's protection is why I pulled away from 19.4. Satan does like to take God's things and twist it for their purpose. Likes to take God's things and twist it. Well, that's all he does. He can't create. All he can do. He got the will of God. Ooh, keep going. It's going to get even better than that. He tries to take God's place. Uh, I'm going down to verse 16. But the earth helped the woman, 
And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation 13, we see a, we see a character. He's been talked about just a little bit before. And we're going to see this name of the beast. John called this person the Antichrist. Uh, Paul called him the lawless one. He called him the son of perdition. Daniel called him the little horn when we were in the little horn. Because you can sit here and think about it. He wants to subdue the power of his father. He's a, mm, I'm trying to think of a word, usurper of power. That's what Satan is. God's got the power, but he's trying to usurp the power from him. And so I like, so John calls him the Antichrist, Paul the lawless one. God just calls him a beast. The end. He just calls him a beast. And so here is the Antichrist coming up. Then stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This is pretty common language. The sea usually means like nations at this point. So this is an implication that the Antichrist himself is not going to be Jewish, but he's going to probably be Gentile. And you can think of it. It's going to be like a world ruler. He's going to be like a world ruler to come out of the sea, out of the nations. And here he says, having seven heads. And so we already know that's referring to kings, kingdoms, rulers of the world. So you can think of bowing down or being in league with Antichrist. You can think about the president of the United States may submit to his authority or rulers of other countries are going to submit to this person's authority. And so here's these seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns. So he's got power, he's got dominion, and on his head's a blasphemous name. And then he goes into further, further descriptions here of him. And go down to verse 4. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So it's Satan himself fueling the Antichrist. And so it's his backing behind him. Verse 5, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue 42 months. Take a wild guess how long 42 months is. Three and a half years. The same things continued all the way through this. So for three and a half years, there'll be peace. And then three and a half years in, you'll see when everything starts unwinding. Remember in Tachyi, when things start going bad, it's going to go bad in a hurry. So then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell on earth. And it was granted. i got to do this. Go to 2 Thessalonians real quick. Chapter 2. I wasn't going to deviate from this, but... We're, we're on good schedule, believe it or not. We're going to be good guys. We're going to finish next week just like, of course, it would be better if my tab for Thessalonians wasn't ripped off. Mine too. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 2. Go to Timothy and turn left. <laughs> All my tabs have been ripped off for Thessalonians. So it's like so much for a quick flip. Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, so here's Paul. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if it is from us, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. Guys, we don't see revival happening before Jesus comes. We see falling away before he comes. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, so there's the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So here's Paul adding to this saying, three and a half years, there's going to be peace. 
the Antichrist, and again, we're going to read it more in here, there's going to be peace. He's going to create peace in Israel. Remember, we already read, he comes on a white horse. Here comes peace. And after three and a half years, there's going to be a new temple built in Jerusalem. And after three and a half years, he's going to walk into the temple. And he declares himself God at that point in the temple. And so there's what Paul is saying. This great falling away, and then he declares himself God. Uh, where are we here? Uh, it was granted him to make war, verse 7. Authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Um, go down to verse number 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So next thing you know, now we've got another beast coming out of the earth. Two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And so this beast that's now coming up, this is the false prophet. And the false prophet has, uh, all I can think of is like to say a hot man. The false prophet has one goal, to point people to the Antichrist. That's his goal, to point people to Antichrist. And here's the thing. He's going around doing lying one wor uh, lying wonders. He's doing fake miracles. And then, guys, this is why I keep saying you've got to be careful. Like You're watching the TV preacher and everybody's coming up there getting healed. This is the same kind of junk the Antichrist is going to be doing sitting here making a spectacle and healing and yeah i don't doubt that sometimes somebody goes to i've heard somebody say they went to a oh it's a witch doctor lady or whatever over in georgia and hey they they healed so and so they could have but i'll give you a hint it wasn't god doing it satan works in a lot of ways as well and so that's exactly how the antichrist apparently the antichrist gets what looks like a deadly wound and there's a fake resurrection of the Antichrist. And so the false prophet takes pres uh, pulls that off. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So you notice there's the signs. He's making a good show. Come on down this morning. Guys, be careful. Guys, be careful. He deceives those who dwell on earth by those signs he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded with the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast both speak and could cause as many as would not to worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there's been an image of the beast made that comes alive. And what's funny, 2,000 years ago, that would probably be crazy for us to think of like, think about a giant statue come to life. Guys, I've been to Disney World. Man, they got walking dinosaurs down there and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, here's another thing. It could actually be that literally an image is made and a demon comes into it, and the demon causes this image of the, of the beast to come alive at this point. It's not any of that's in line. <coughs> So at this point, the entire world is just demon influenced. He causes he causes all, both small, great, rich, poor, free, and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who understanding calculate the number of the beast. For as the number of a man, his number is 666. Seven is perfection in the Bible, right? So the number of man is 666. Because for whatever it is we try and do, we'll never be God. So 666, we were created on the sixth day, and we will never be God. We will always be short of God. And so we've got this number. Now, does it mean a literal 666 on the number on the... It is the symbol, though, that there will be something. There will be some kind of sign. And what's funny, 20 years ago, I would have never thought about it, but they already make microchips that they install in people's hands where you can do other countries are using it. So it's kind of like where you can do the tap. 
I do tap all the time. We got a chip in my credit card. You walk up to the cash register, lay it on there, and boom, buy, buy my gas. Go to the grocery store, tap the screen. That they're already trying to go that route. So at this point, imagine there'll be a chip, and you'll go up, and all you're buying or selling, because think about it, how many of you use cash for all your purchases now? You have a bank account, and you use, you use this in order to buy and to sell. And so if you're not willing to sit down and obey the beast, you won't have a job, you won't have, and so I had a bunch of people, you know, it was back with the COVID vaccines, one, do you notice something? The COVID vaccine was not getting the mark of the beast because taking the mark of the beast literally pledges your allegiance to who? Satan. Well, Antichrist, yeah, so <laughs> Satan. And so that pledges your allegiance to Antichrist when you receive the mark. So that would mean that the Antichrist would have to already be revealed now. Antichrist doesn't reveal himself to, as Antichrist until three and a half years into the tribulation so we can't you can't be duped right now into getting the mark of the beast but now was it a little like though we've seen so many things where we see pictures of what happens in the tribulation now a good grief my wife she almost lost her job Lindsay almost lost her job there's probably more of you in here that almost got fired for so have we seen a little picture of this so far yeah, we've already seen a picture of this so far. People in the military getting kicked out. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Revelation 14. Oh, I got to pick it up and roll. 20 minutes. And with him, 144,000. Guys, we already read about the 144,000. It was what? 12,000 from 12 tribes. There was 144,000. Jewish supercharged evangelists for Christ. So when people say no one's going to get saved in the tribulation, you need to understand this. No one that had an opportunity to get saved. See if I can say this and make it clear. Let's see. I can't think of what I'm trying to say. One of you may have to help me put in the words. If you, I'll, man, if you, I'll, if you had the opportunity to get saved now, you won't. But for anyone who didn't get an opportunity to get saved now, then they will get their opportunity come later, and there will be people saved. So you can imagine people who, which means, guys, if you were in church and did all this, guys, this goes with the Hebrews so good. If you were in church and you departed from the truth and all this, and, and I think that's what somebody would think. It was like, well, when I see everybody disappear, I'll, I'll be like, hmm, I'll get saved then. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because what we learn in Hebrews is on that day God pulls me up out of here, if you had your opportunity already, the only way you get saved is if the Holy Spirit calls on you. Amen. And we've already seen God say, on that day we're gone and you're left behind, His Holy Spirit's going to depart from men at that point. He's not coming back to you. You had your chance, God's out of here. Holy Spirit's done with you. But what I love is He'll come to others, though. To the ones who never had a chance, God gives them a chance, even in this dark time. Having his Father's name written on their forehead. So here you got these 144,000, and now they're, they're praising and they're singing at this point. Uh, yeah, read in verse 2, they've got voices like waters, voice like loud thunder, the sounds of harp is playing. They're having a party at this point. They sang it as if it were a new song before the throne. So here's these 144,000. They've been killed. Now they're with God worshiping. But before they were killed, they led so many people to Christ. Uh, uh, trying to, it's hard to like skip stuff, isn't it? You know, just read it all. We'll be here till Christmas. Uh, oh, go to verse number six. Verse number six. Here you go. Here's your last altar call. Then I saw another angel. So the 144,000 have already been called home. And so here it is, the final altar call. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, 
So an angel is going to literally fly. I was thinking about like the little Santa Claus tracker they use at Christmas time. You can think about this angel covering the entirety of the earth, preaching the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I just love this because here in this final day, no one will say they didn't have a chance. Every single person will have their chance. God will send an angel to make sure everyone hears the gospel, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. And I think this is where it goes back to Matthew 24 again. There's a lot of people that think, you know, Jesus isn't coming back until it's our job. Jesus isn't coming back till we've reached every single, and the word is ethnos for nation. Every single, this is every ethnic group. A lot of people think Jesus can't come back until this is our job. This is our job to send missionaries to every single place to translate the Bible into every language. It's not... It's not on us to reach every person because what is God going to do before Jesus comes back? He'll send an angel out and he'll take care of his business. So, yeah, it's true. He's not coming back till every ethnos, till every nation is reached. So he'll send an angel to make sure in that final day every nation is reached. Now, it's not me saying should we not be doing that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But don't be thinking, hey, there's just two people groups left, and we've done this, and then Jesus comes back. We're not bringing Jesus back. That's when it's in God's good time. Uh, go down to verse 14 now, moving up a little bit. So now we're getting to Armageddon at this point. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, To him who sat on the cloud, thrust your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's judgment. God's give the last, alt the last altar call has been given, and now God takes the sickle and he thrusts it in, and the harvest is started. God's judgment is on the earth. Go down to verse number 20. It'll give you a little, little bit of a taste of what's going on in this judgment. Verse 20, And the winepress was trampled outside the city. Blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles. That's about five feet. For 1,600 furlongs, 200 miles. It's the exact length of Israel. God thrusts his sickle, and the blood flows 200 miles long, five feet deep across the earth. Revelation chapter 15. Here's the last seven judgments. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the last seven plagues, for in them the wrath of God and guys, at this point, it's going to come. It's going to come fast. We've had seven seals, seven trumpets, and now seven bowls. Seven bowls or vials, depending on your translation, of God's wrath to be poured out at this point. I'm going to actually kind of flip a little bit. Go to verse number 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of seven angels were completed. If you're wondering, I moved to this verse and wanted to explicitly call it out. Wherever they were at, and God was with everyone there, and will be there, as God dumps out these seven bowls, he moves everybody else out. And all I can sit here and think about is how bad is it when God says, this part's on me. I need y'all to step out of the room for a second. It's kind of like when we handle church discipline. If something like that happens, we're going to ask visitors to leave the room. At this point, God asks everybody else, step out of the room. 
I've got to finish this with her. Then I heard a loud voice, Revelation chapter 16. I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and the foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast. And so the word loathsome sore, it's helkos. It's like a cancerous sore. And uh, I was reading about up in Philadelphia this week, and I was watching these people that are addicted to these veterinarian tranquilizers. Have any of y'all seen that on the news? It causes necrosis of the skin. It was showing these people out on the street with just huge hunks of flesh eating all the way down to their bone. Like I said, do we see pictures of what happens? Yeah, we can already start to see pictures. So these people that had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshiped his image, now these cancerous sores. Then verse 13, a second, or verse 3, excuse me. A second angel poured out his bowl in the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living creature died. Not a third. Remember, we've already seen that. A third, at this point, the entire sea becomes blood, and everything in the sea is now dead and rotting in the totality of the oceans. Now the third bowl, verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowls on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Not a third of the fresh water. Remember, we read that already. Now all fresh water on earth becomes as blood. All fresh water is poison. Go to verse 8 to the fourth angel. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And so is this the solar flares? Is this what's going on with the sun? But the sun is unleashing its power. It's scorching the men with fire. Verse 9, men were scourged with great heat, and they blasphemed. So here they are, God unleashing his fury, and all they can do is cuss God. They blaspheme the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. They still will not repent. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl. Notice how these are happening. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. There's no light. Imagine the blackest black where you can no longer see your face, and the people are literally in such pain, they're literally gnawing their tongues off because of the pain. They blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their... Do you notice this? They blaspheme God because of their pains and their sores. It means there wasn't, you get this plague, stop. Now a new one, stop. It means all these plagues were cumulative. God just kept pouring it on and kept pouring it on. And now... We're getting ready. God's making way for the battle of Armageddon. So he's literally clearing the playing ground. The sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east, that's Anatolia. It's actually the word is Anatolia, which is Turkey. So that the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. So these, this is referring to demons. So three demons coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That verse is what's known as the unholy trinity. And so you see demons doing things. These spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them. I love this. So here you see the unholy trinity gathering the armies of the world together through their false signs and wonders to go do battle with God. They, as Billy Graham would say, I read the end of the book, we win. It's not going to go good for them. Now we look in verse 15. Uh, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And they gathered them together in, to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, which is a real place. It's the Jezreel Valley. 
It's actually interesting. Nazareth overlooks the Jezreel Valley where this is, which means literally Jesus spent his childhood looking down at the final battle of Armageddon where it would be fought. Napoleon saw the spot. He claimed it was the finest battleground on earth was that section of the land. So then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from heaven from the throne saying, it is done. There are noises and thunderings and lightnings and it's a great earthquake such as mighty and the great earthquake which had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her cup of the wine to the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away. The mountains were not found, and great hell fell upon the earth. Each hellstone, the weight of a talent, that's 100-pound hellstones falling from the sky. 100-pound hellstones. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the earth. Plague of the hell, since the plague was exceedingly great. Now, where are we at? Five minutes, okay. The goal was 19. I don't know if we'll get there. So now we're in a parenthesis. So Revelation 17 is kind of like, all right, pause. Now take a second. Here's a pause. Revelation 17, here's a little review of the last half of the tribulation. So the question would be, is there religion during the tribulation? Yeah, there will be religion. Uh, in verse number one, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on the many waters. This false heart, this great harlot that is the false church whereas the church is a bride the harlot is the false church that will exist at this point and so in verse number three look at what he says in verse three and i saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of the names of blasphemy guys it's perfect it's the false religion and the antichrist work together it's politics and religion combined so it's the Antichrist working together with this false religious system, this harlot having the names and the power and everything's here. So it's just religion mixed with politics and powers. And verse number six, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Guys, I'll be honest. I think, that, I think the great harlot, I think the false church is already here. I think that's already here being established at this point. Uh, go to all the way down. I'm going to try and get through 17 and 18 in five minutes. Uh, go, go down to verse 14. Uh, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So the harlot and the beast try to make war with the Lamb, you can't beat the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Verse 15, And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which you saw in the great beast. These will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So for the Antichrist that comes to power, he does it with the harlot. In other words, the false church and the Antichrist come together to take power. But the thing is, you can't share... Well, I'm totally thinking of Star Wars references now at this point. You don't share power. So as they come to power together, eventually, eventually the Antichrist kills the harlot. He kills the false church because eventually, who does the Antichrist want all the eyes on? I want you to look at me. I don't want you to be with this religion stuff. I don't share power. Revelation chapter 18. So there will be a false church which will be consumed. Revelation 18, you'll see, you'll see another Babylon, Babylon the Great. Revelation chapter 18 is about a world economic system. Uh, verse number 2. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the dwelling place of demons. The world economic system has collapsed at this point. That's it. Everything has collapsed. Verse 5, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her in equity. 
Guys, what happens in the rest of this chapter here, we see the economy collapses, banks collapse, everything. Money, worthless. You can be a billionaire. It's not going to do you any good at this point. I will read just a little bit more, though. Verse number 9. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. Guys, Bill Gates is going to be a worthless dude when this day comes. When they see the smoke of her burning, all the rich people are going to be crying because they don't have any money anymore. It's gone. Your bank account is void. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, and that's just speaking to this brevity of time, your judgment has come. All the merchants of the earth will weep and will mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. There's no buying and there's no selling. There's no money. Merchandise, look at this, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of the most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and fragrant frankincense, wine and flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots. And I thought the last part in my New King James, it says, in the bodies of souls and men at this point. And all I could think about was sex trafficking and everything else. There's nothing. There's nothing to buy with. There's nothing to buy. Everything is over. There's nothing left. God has reaped upon the earth at this point. So your money is no good. Everything. You know what people are just trying to do? They're just trying to survive. That's it. All that's left is survival at this point. That's all they have. Uh, go down to verse 17. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. So here's the collapse of this world economy. It is over. They threw dust on their heads and cry out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, for that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. And I love this. The earth is coming to pieces there is no more rich there's no more poor there's just can i can i make it till tomorrow and look it in heaven rejoice over over her O heaven and you holy apostles and prophets for god has avenged you on her so for all of us in heaven that had to deal with all the pains of this earth in that moment god says rejoice i've destroyed it I've taken care of it. It's over. Verse 22. The sounds of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpets will not be heard anymore. No craftsmen. I don't know if you get this. The sound of harpists, musicians, there's no music. There's nothing to celebrate anymore. I, I wrote my personal note I wrote to myself is the party is over. So all the people thinking they're going to live it up. But now here's what's cool. I'm not going into Revelation 19. I'm going to stop and we're going to get there next week. But what is cool about Revelation 19? The party begins. The party down here is over. But in Revelation 19, you could title that The Party Begins. Because in Revelation 19, Revelation 19 is all about one thing. Jesus is coming back in Revelation 19. Jesus come to get us, but if you remember, good grief, we got a song. You even remind us of it. Where do we meet Jesus at? There's a meeting in there. Jesus comes to get us, takes us home. Everything unfolds here. And in Revelation chapter 19, it is time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, he says. I got to read it. Just one more verse, verse 16. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We're getting married. Jesus is coming back. Things on the earth are going bad. Christ is about to come on the white horse. 
We're going to see how it all unfolds next week as we close this out. I want to close with this. this. This is always the hardest part of this kind of preaching. On Sunday morning, I know where I'm going to take off the plane. I know where I'm going to land the plane. But when we do like this, it's into any of the preachers in the house. It's how do you land the plane. And the same thing, anybody that gives a testimony somewhere, Brother Andy, you need to know where you're going to land the plane. What's going to be the last thing you leave with on the night? The biggest thing I want to leave with on the night that I hope you've seen is what we've already went through. It goes along perfectly with Hebrews. When this happens, it happens fast. When this happens, there isn't a, like, oh, I went to church. I understand this. I'll get saved when I see this stuff happens. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You had your time now. God gave you your chance now. You pass this opportunity now, there is no, what you read about is what waits. I mean, I'd have to say, here's the thing, what we will read about next week, everyone will be one day resurrected. It's almost better to die now lost than it will be to go through the tribulation. But the thing is, the tribulation Everything that we've read, it's nothing compared to what waits a lost sinner. It's nothing. The sores, the fire, the... Do you remember at one part it was so bad last week, they wanted to kill themselves, but they couldn't even kill themselves because God didn't want them to die. He wanted them to suffer for what they had done. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Think about that tonight when he's thrusting his sickle, reaping the harvest on the earth. As bad as everything we've read so far, it's a drop in the bucket compared to an eternity in the lake of fire. That's right. And that's the final outcome. The beast is going there. The harlot's going there. To all those who don't know Jesus Christ. Guys, I'm going to ask. I haven't been doing this on Wednesday nights, but I will do it tonight because I'm feeling guilty for not doing it. You should never you're going to see from now on Sunday mornings we're going to bow our heads every Sunday and I'm going to give an opportunity for somebody every Sunday morning. So I'm going to ask if you would to bow your heads at this time. If you bow your heads, close your eyes. If there's someone in here tonight who's not made that commitment to God. You know who Jesus is, but you've never said, God, I truly belong to you. If you've never said those words, this tribulation, that's what's coming. That's what you can expect. And worse beyond. But here's the thing. God sent his son so that for everyone who believes in him, you'll never know that. To the one who belongs to Christ, you never know anything. Everything we've read about, you watch from the upper deck. If there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, just look, lift your head and you look at me. Make eye contact with me. Because you don't have to leave here that way today. No getting up, no raising hands, running down aisles. You just look at me, and you can go home tonight with the peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Father God, I thank you, God, for this church. I thank you for each and every soul here, God. I pray for each and every one here, God. God, I thank you for the promise that one day we leave here, God, and we'll be, you'll be waiting for us to meet us and take us home to a new to a new heaven, God, to a new earth, to a new Jerusalem. God, one day justice will be on this earth. God, and I thank you for that justice. I thank you for saving me, though, God, and not giving me the justice I deserve. Thank you for taking that from me. Father, be with each and every one here. Be with those and bless those on the internet that watch this video. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell somebody that you love them.